please. So welcome. Our first speaker is Professor Mia B. Gotto from University of Kentucky. Professor Gotto's research focuses on modern Japanese literature during and since the Meiji period. She's particularly interested in the emerging process of criticism as in in late 19th century. She's currently working on her book project, Critical Failures, Theory and the Practice of Literary Criticism of Late 19th Century Japan. Professor Gotter received her doctorate degree in East Asian Studies at, university, at Princeton University. Before joining the University of Kentucky, she taught at the University of Virginia and at the City University of New York. And today she's going to present a paper entitled Frenery in the Static Motion, the case of the early 20th century Japanese urbanscape. Welcome. Thank you very much um, again, Ina, for the, the very generous introduction. Um, so let me share my screen um, for the presentation. Can, can you see the screen, my screen? My, my, okay, great, thank you. So um, in this paper, I examined early 20th century Japanese writer Kaji Motojiro's short story, The Lemon. I explore the intersection of Kaji's descriptions and an emerging urbanscape in 1920s Kyoto. Kyoto experienced a massive scale of transformation around the turn of the 20th century while Kaji was exposed to the city under reconstruction at the time, his writing somehow does not display interest in recollecting radical changes of the scenery. My contention is that despite the minimal references to the changes, Kaji's descriptions capture an ambiguous mode of being in time and moving in space one that falls between stasis and kinesis that was experienced in the context of urbanization. The lemon shows that the ambiguous in-betweenness was prompted by urbanization and ubiquitous in everyday life. In so doing, the text presents the liminality as a particularly modern relationship that the city dweller formed vis-a-vis -vis the autoling environment. This paper suggests that such ambiguity be recognized yet another constitutive experience of modern life. So the lemon, this short story presents a narrator who provides a first person account of his past experiences in 1920s Kyoto. What was happening in 1920s Kyoto? Kyoto, under the Meiji regime, actually began to serve a uniquely important role. The place had been a capital of the country since nine, uh, sorry, 794 for over 10 centuries. But towards the late 19th century, the city quickly assumed an ideologically charged position as a repository of the imperial history and, by extension, national integrity, coherence, and authenticity. While the arrival of the Meiji period prompted, prompted the transfer of the capital from Kyoto to Edo renamed Tokyo, the shift of the political center in fact resulted in a colossal scale of physical rebuilding of both capitals, Old Kyoto and New Tokyo. The making of Tokyo as a new imperial metro metropolis coincided with, or rather, necessitated the reinvention of Kyoto as another no less crucial node in imperial Japan that would guarantee the nation's uninterrupted lineage. The turn of the 20th century witnessed the alternation of three different emperors, Meiji, Taisho, and Showa. So those decades hosted multiple occasions that required a drastic urban planning for Kyoto so that the city could stage ceremonial imperial events such as enthronements and funerals. In so doing, Kyoto continued to reinstantiate its significance to the royal family and more important to the emerging empire of Japan. The remaking of Kyoto as Japan's symbolic center entailed many layers of physical changes, including the development of infrastructure, 
The Lake Biwa Canal, which was completed in 1890, began to offer the stable supply of water and electricity to the city. Trains were first introduced to Kyoto in 1895. The inauguration of trains were spurred by the National Fair held in the city the same year for the purpose of promoting the nation's industrialization. The city's development involved the rezoning of streets and broader installation of electrified devices such as streetcars and streetlights. When Kaji, the author, lived in Kyoto in the early, uh, early 1920s, Kyoto had already built its foundation to expand into a megalopolis. So there is no doubt that the lemon was written in the middle of Kyoto's modern transformations as the text makes certain references to changes that appeared in the 1920s. However, the text's historical reflection is very subtle. Instead of taking note of the drastic changes of the cityscape, the narrator recollects his quotidian habit of wandering around and losing himself in familiar back alleys of the city. And this subtlety is a point of my paper. The notable quality that the narrator repeats as he remembers his past walking experience is its involuntariness. And then I quote the narrator's word here, and then quote, something prevented me from staying in one place. Hence, I, all the time I wandered from place to place like a vagabond, unquote. The narrator emphasizes many times how he was stationless and always drifted from one friend's place to another. In fact, about a half of the entire text is used to recount the narrator's experiences of roaming around the city and losing himself in it. The reason behind the young narrator's constant strolling remains unstated. He was on the move, not because he wished to, but because he was not allowed to remain stationary. The idly wandering narrator in The Lemon in 1920s Kyoto echoes the figure that Walter Benjamin depicted as a flanon who walked around modern Paris in the 19th century. For both wanderers, the walking in the transforming cityscape is practiced without specific purposes. They were just walking because they wanted to or they needed to, they were not allowed otherwise. The resemblance between Kaji's narrator and Benjamin's flanel suggests that the aimless, inexplicable nature of the walking was itself a historical phenomenon, a possible relationship that city dwellers had vis-a-vis -vis the changing cityscape. Twice in the text, the narrator notes his disorientation in the city, and then I quote, where and in what manner had I been walking, unquote. Unlike many other places in Japan, Kyoto was designed with clean grid patterns and easily recognizable street names. Part of the urban city planning that I mentioned before included the road reform, which accommodated the separation of sidewalks and roadways, widening of major thoroughfares, and the reinscription of the clean grid configuration of major streets. In short, the Kyoto that Kaji's narrator roamed around in the 1920s had been recently reconstructed, re restructured in a way that orienting oneself became extremely easier. It's hard to get lost in 1920s Kyoto because it was so cleanly done. The young narrator still went astray, losing track of his own movement. He walked the alleyways while also being taken over by what surrounded him. The sequence emerges as if his self, the putative agent who could exercise his will, had been deprived of a stable subject position and vanished amid his own aimless drifting movement. He was mobile, but simultaneously, not so much so because his self was slowly dissolving away without him realizing so. 
The act of walking took place in the physical space for a certain duration of time, which nonetheless escaped the recognition and eroded the sense of continuity of the walker. The street conducts the flannel into a vanished time. Benjamin would have described the young knight as losing himself in this way. The wandering recounted in the lemon, therefore, cannot be situated on the neatly organized grid patterns of Kyoto, as the street somehow turned into unrecognizable, uncontrollable space to the walker. The lemon stays away from describing definitive movements and passing of time. What took place during the narrator's walking remains illegible in the text. The narrator's wandering is involuntary and unmindful and engages with the surrounding environments to a minimal degree. What the text provides instead is ambiguity of movement and temporality, the state of being lost and unaware. And such ambiguity is presented in the text as a young narrator's everyday experience. In other words, the lemma suggests the floating, unregistered moments were essential components of the wanderer's quotidian life. Approached this way, Kaji's text emerges as a writerly reaction to the historical forces of modernization, rationalization of space, enforcement of order, urban planning rampant in 1920s Kyoto. Kaji's writing engaged with a wave of those changes precisely because it featured the floating, elusive moments in urban living. The text not only highlights a liminal state of being, but also illuminates liminality's ordinariness. The indeterminate motion and the temporality in the text leads us to a more nuanced way of contemplating an experience of the city walker of the time. The experience might have been common, but not quite recognized at the time precisely because of its faintness. Was I moving? Maybe, but how? The narrative repeats uncertain moments and in so doing suggests that the impossibility of locating what took place, not being able to register what was perceived was constitutive of being in urbanity. This ambiguity inscribed in Lemona extends beyond the boundaries of stasis and kinesis because Kaji's writing exhibits several modes of visuality simultaneously conjured in the narrator's recount. As a result, Kaji's descriptions leave the narrator's perception in an unfixed state, as if it had nowhere to settle. So here is one textual example of how the visual contamination takes place. So in this passage, the narrator recall, re recalls his walking habit, and then I quote, while walking around those alleys, I sometimes sought to conjure an illusion that this place was no longer Kyoto, but Sendai or Nagasaki, somewhere hundreds of miles away from Kyoto, a house nation that I had traveled to those places. I wished to escape Kyoto and then go somewhere I knew no one. What would it be like if somehow where I am now might have turned into that somewhere? When my illusion started to succeed, I would then put the pigments of my imagination on it. It was nothing more special than the superimposition of my illusion and that trembled down, uh, tumble down alleys. And then I enjoyed losing sight of my real self in it, unquote. So this passage shows a diverse range of confusions, one thing blending with something else. First, it illustrates the process through which the alleys of Kyoto becomes conflated with the imaginary place in the narrator's self-caused illusion. What is physically available to him and what is imagined as a result begin to overlap with one another in his alternative vision. Furthermore, the narrator mobilizes cinematic rhetoric to explain this phenomenon. What the narrator imagines is verbalized as the superimposition of his illusion upon the physical cityscape. 
the original Japanese term, Niju Utsushi for superimposition was coined specifically to refer to the technique of double exposure in film production during the 1920s. This, um, the rhetoric of Niju Utsushi superimposition in the lemon models after the cinematic effect of being captivated by concrete images of physically non-existent objects projected on the film screen. In that sense, this passage can be read as a reenactment of cinematic effect. However, the text does not seem to set its goal merely in imitating cinema in the linguistic format, because the narrator begins to embellish his cinematic vision by coloring it with the pigments of imagination. What the narrator sees is ultimately rendered with elements almost exclusively associated with painting, not cinema. At once cinematic and then painterly, concrete and hallucinatory. In describing his sight, the narrator's bubble illustration slowly wavers between those different modes of realms. The final destination of a medley of visions is left unidentified because the narrator is losing sight of himself. The narrator's self as a final determiner vanishes into the very multiplicity of his perception process. The narrative continues to elude the revelatory moment because what the narrator experiences remains unfixed and afloat without being able to land on a single plane because the narrator's perceptions waver between one mode of expression and another. The lemon thus forges an additional layer of ambiguity and then further instantiates the commonality of uncertain, unidentify unidentifiable experiences brought by Kyoto's urban transformations. Kaji's text shows what perceptual experiences are like in modern Kyoto by hosting the ambiguous coexistence of perceptions. In a sense, by doing that, the text actually counter demonstrates its linguistic strengths. In conclusion, the dominant logic that dictated modern Kyoto's transformation was the order and hierarchy. While written under the historical context, the lemon exhibits another logic that revolves around ambiguity. Instead of presenting this alternative logic of ambiguity as a radical disagreement with the central forces of modernization, the text suggests that being left in a liminal state was part of the experience of existing in urbanscape. The text's embracement of ambiguity as a constitutive experience undoes the general assumption of what urban development brought about to the city dwellers' everyday life. Wandering, floating, losing, hovering, wavering. Kaji's descriptions highlights those inert states of being, inviting the reader to linger in moments of uncertainty together with the text. In so doing, the lemon leaves open a liminal space for us to recondition our scholarly approaches to the early 20th century writer's engagement with urbanization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gaucho. Um, now, our second presentation, our speaker is Malta Frey. He studied the fine arts at both Academy of Fine Arts, Munster, Germany, and the College of Fine Arts of Shanghai University, China, as well as technology as Westphalish. Sorry if I mispronounced the German. Westphalish. Philips. Universität. Westphalish, Wilhelm University, Munster, Germany. Working as an artist since 2018, he began a now ongoing dissertation on meta-humanist societies depicted in post-cyberpunk anime in 2020. In his academic work, he pursues a visual approach aiming to take pop culture works like anime series as a form of art. His areas of interest extends over fine and visual arts theology, Japanese philosophy, and opposed in the meta-humanist theory. And his presentation today is entitled City Image 
see the images in Ghosting in the Shell and the Psychopaths, social structures from cyberpunk to post the cyberpunk. Welcome, Malta. Thank you so much. I think this was a great introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here again and to see you all and be able to share my presentation. This is uh, my first conference at all because I'm really new to all this academic world. Um, so bear with me while I now share my screen. Here we go. As I've said, um, well, as Jean said, I will be talking about urban spaces and anime ghosts in the shell and psychopaths and the social structures there and depicted from cyberpunk for which I hold ghost in the shell as representative to post cyberpunk um, for which I hold psychopaths, the series that first aired in 2012 hold representative. Um, I will be examining the social st structures and thereby looking at the city imageries depicted in the film because the city has long been a signifier for social structures in movies because the city has been the place of the modern society ever since the early 20th century and also have been the locus of filmic production as well. Um, the city in movies and film in general can uh, signify for, yeah, class divisions and by spatial structures because city uh, and film itself is both spatially structured. The genre cyberpunk that originated in the US in the 1980s focuses more on the human technology interaction in terms of cyborgs and thereby questioning whether there is such a human, uh, something like a human nature at all and questioning thereby the Conditio Humana focusing on the individual subject. The anime by Mamoru Oshii, Ghost in the Shell from 1995 is, yeah, it can be said like a cyberpunk classic. And I turn to anime to uh, examining the difference between cyberpunk and post cyberpunk because anime has a very richness in cyberpunk since from the 1980s when films like Blade Runner and novels like Neuromancer first, yeah, swept over to Japan, they found a very interesting, uh, interested audience. And ever since then, in Japanese areas, there has been a lot of fictions on the cyberpunk and now also post cyberpunk. But post cyberpunk um, is something that not focuses on the human technology interaction that strongly, and but it is in tradition of cyberpunk. Uh, science fiction author Lawrence Person coined the term in 1999, and he said that while cyberpunk is about technological interactions and thereby alienation from daily life, post cyberpunk should or focuses more on technology as a society. So the focus sh seems to shift from um, the individual subject to technology and society. However, there has have only been a few examinations on that subject, and this is a very uh, relatively new area. I will begin by examining the city imagery of Ghost in the Shell from 1995 to uh, lay grounds for what city imagery in cyberpunk does, and then do the comparison to the post-cyberpunk series in Psychopaths. Um, I have to get you all out of my way because you're, ah yeah, so this is working now. Thank you. Um, bear with me, please. Um, Ghost in the Shell um, is about protagonist Motoko Kusanagi, the head of police section Unit 9, which we can see here in this beautiful shot in front of the Indian movie Omnipresent City imagery. The film is out of is shot out of her perspective, more or less. It's the perspective on, of the individual subject. And Kusanagi is undergoing an uh, existential crisis because of her cyborg body enhancement. She's a full body cyborg, and but rather, but she's not feeling empowered because of that, but rather is an existential crisis because um, parts of her body belong to the government she works for, which she quit, she would have to give them up and thereby she questions what she can really call her own and what she is made of. Um, deliverance out of that misery is granted or maybe even something like a religious salvation by the technologically life form Puppet Master that was originally a hacker program that became self-aware in the net. By merging with Puppet Master, Kusanagi gains access to the unlimited space of the data realm and thereby can escape the bodily and socioeconomic restrictions she's feeling herself confined in. City imagery plays a really important role, um, sorry, um, in visualizing this narrative. Um, there can 
a division between an upper city and the lower city can be detected. Um, and the lower, uh, the upper sphere, I argue, is uh, the long for data realm, which Kusanagi wants to escape to. We always have the predominant bottom up direction of view in the movie. We are always on the ground with Kusanagi looking up to high rising buildings, skyscrapers, touching the sky and sometimes even breaking the frame of the screen. And famous Japan scholar William O. Gardner has identified the city with what he calls a cyber sublime, meaning a metaphysical experience invoked by the city imagery that makes the otherwise invisible data net in the movie visible to the viewer. I, can, I agree with the Gardner in that term, but this is only the case for, as I've said, the upper sphere of the city. The lower sphere of the city, however, is more a locus of surface and restriction. We can see here that in contrast to the high rising shiny buildings, we have uh, rusty, dusty inhabited areas. They're somewhat dirty and thus seem even more tangible. And the predominant bottom up direction of view is always blocked by signs, cables, traffic lights and bridges um, that yeah, hold the viewer and hold Kusanagi on the ground. This is resonating in the depiction of the city with, uh, with what uh, Japanese architect Hajime Yutsukata has called the city as a sea of science in the 1990s. And also what Frederick Jameson has coined deathlessness as the predominant um, factor of postmodernism. Um, Hajime Yutsukata argues that, argues that um, in postmodern Japan and uh, consumed society um, architecture become, uh, loses substance and only visualizes desires and consume and merchandising and everything thus becomes somewhat shallow and more like an information flow rather than architectural substance. So this is can be seen here in the shot that Kusanagi experienced this surfaceness surfaceness, I think it's right, and the restriction by keeping her on the ground, preventing her from going up to the upper sphere of the city to the longed for data realm that promises the illusion of the socioeconomic restrictions. So I therefore conclude for Girls in the Shell that the city imagery in this cyberpunk classic um, is a signifier for the data realm in case of the upper sphere and the cyberspace, which is really, really cyberpunk typical. So nearly every cyberpunk narrative um, resolves in the protagonist losing itself in somewhat a kind of a cyberspace in a transcendental cyberspace. But the lowest view of the city facilitates a dystopian capitalist restriction and an even invoking a socioeconomic hierarchy because Kusanagi is not able to free herself out of the feeling, uh, of, out of a feeling of the misery because um, deliverance is granted to her by technology, and that is even depending on her being that technology developed as she is as a cyborg. Other people that don't work for a government organization might not have the chance to elude that restriction. On the other hand, the post cyberpunk series Psychopaths, which the first season aired in 2012, paints an altogether different picture in terms of the city and in terms of its narrative because it focuses uh, on society as a whole and not so much on the individual individuum. Um, psych the near future Japan of psychopaths is governed by a technologically govern governing system, the so-called civil system, which constantly monitors everybody and every person in society mm -hmm. uh, by means of the so-called psychopaths, by which the system can anticipate um, whether one is about to commit a crime and also tell which place in society is most fit for that person, thereby creating something like a platonic state where everybody has their place and everybody seems to be happy in that because the system seems to be uh, taking good care of everybody. It's not painted as a dystopian scenario of a monitoring state, but rather as a utopia that is neither really good or bad, but as a functioning system of a collectivist order. The city in Psychopaths can be said to be equivalent with society as a whole, because as the narrative makes clear, there's no 
society outside of the city. The entire agricultural sector in the Psycho Passes Japan has been automated. Nobody's living there, nobody can live there. It's just to support the urban society. And this is historically resonating with concepts of maybe the megalopolis project, the city Japan, which was thought about in the 20th century after the Second World War and the postmodern consumerist times to, uh, and also because of the lack of inhabitable land in Japan to, um, yeah, widen the urban structures into something that can really be called the city Japan and maybe structures like around the Tokyo Bay area is somewhat that has, yeah, is some, is some like something like that. And also um, the like, agricultural sector in Japan has been largely automated after the second world war um, also because of the lack of workforce. So one had to get creative mechanically. And um, it had been said that maybe therein can be seen a reason or maybe one of the grounds why the country became technology that developed as it did in the 20th century. And this historically, uh, historical plans have been taken further in the city of Psychopaths. Like Ghosts in the Shell, there's been a strong division between top and bottom that can be detected in Psychopaths, but different from Mamoru Oshii's movie, we have um, here now a top-down direction of view. The protagonists, the action always happens at the top. They are on the same level as the high-rising shiny buildings that seem to present a um, secure and mostly happy collectivist society. And also the present, because as you can see in the right shot, under that shiny high-rising buildings, there seem to be ruins, decayed structures, older structures of something that is lying past that. Um, I'm sorry if the images are a little too narrow and a little too small. And the border to which lies below the upper sphere is often marked by water or flooded areas. And believe that is where the crime occurs. It's down in the dark where the crime occurs because the city seems to be um, underlined with uh, older structures, forgotten structures that the um, orderly society has no access to. And there are the people that uh, seem to be rendered outside of society. Um, they are painted in like a dark humanist autonomy. They are seeking self-fulfillment at all costs and bringing chaos and disrupting the orderly society of the upper sphere. Um, they murder, they commit crime. And on the right side, we see a culprit who just beats a woman to death with a hammer in the public. And while the bystanders just watch, don't, uh, not knowing what to do because they're living in a such secure society that they cannot comprehend even what is going on. Um, this seems to be something like a past that the, the present of the orderly society um, aims to bury and to overcome. However, it is still coming up from the down structures and disrupting the upper present. And this is further highlighted by a, a light and dark hierarchy um, in the movie. So the high rising orderly society of the upper sphere is always painted in shiny colors and bright and light while the lower sphere is always painted in the dark colors and not really pleasant. And we see here on the left side through the eyes of the culprit that bit the woman to death with the hammer, he is fleeing from policemen and he is led away by city drones, led away from the city lights we see in the background. And on the right side, we see him being uh, finally captured and executed by policemen and he's turning away from the light of the high rising orderly society that is shining through the windows. This is resonating with what Michel Foucault has called orders through visibility as a terms of governing a society by means of structuring and uh, focus what is seen and what is not seen. So by attempting to keep it in the dark, the civil system, the upper orderly collectivist society aims to shift attention away from what is lying underneath and thereby exclude people um, that bring chaos outside of society. And in the narrative of psychopaths, it seems to be justified to do so because they murder and they bring violence and they bring chaos. So, I conclude city imagery from cyberpunk to uh, from cyberpunk to post cyberpunk in terms of ghost in the shell to psychopaths. That in the former in cyberpunk, the top signifies the top city signifies a data realm, a cyberspace that aims for an out of society. One wants uh, wants to 
go out of society, elude the socioeconomic hypercapitalist dystopia that is facilitated by the socioeconomic hierarchy of the bottom. While on the other hand, there is no out in post cyberpunk. So the city is completely equivalent with society. The top is a collectivist orderly society, but nothing is lying above that. So rather than going up, the movement seems to be going down in a kind of archaeological process to pervade the bottom, the chaos, the danger the, that is brought by autonomy to fully, um, yeah, to fully gain control over that so that nothing would be left. But it's some, the uh, bottom will all, is always left in the narrative of psychopaths. So rather than having yeah, the civil system, the upper sphere gaining fully control, we see an entanglement of a progressive present, the upper sphere, and the and disruptors, uh, disrupting past. So it's an, like an ever-changing movie, uh, moving structure, rather than a status quo out of which we can move out of. So this uh, seems to say that change in post cyberpunk can only exist within society rather than going out of society because going out of seems not to be possible it's also like uh yeah to say no to a cyberspace to an alternative world but that change has to be made in society and therefore society as a complex gains more importance but however the danger um remains that the order of society might outweigh the individual and like it is maybe in contemporary China. So a collectivist order is always in the danger of yeah, subverting the individual to something that is not really necessary in their own. But the entanglement of individualism and collectivism seems to be portrayed, uh, portrayed as the future. And the question is how we can manage and how this will be managed and balanced in the future and also who and what ideology will remain in control because psychopaths seems pretty um they are free of capitalist structures while it's not really explained how that happens so this will be some questions i will concern myself with in the future thank you all so much thank you Magda. now let's welcome our third presenter, Simona Gallo. Professor Simona Gallo is um, from University of Bergamo. She holds a PhD in linguistic, literary, literary and intercultural studies in European and extra-European perspectives from the University of Milan. And she's currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Bergamo in Italy, where she teaches Chinese literature. Her research interests involve Chinese and Sinophone literature, translation studies, and especially self-translation. She has published several papers on the topic of cultural translation, self-translation, intertextuality, and authored a monography about Gao Xingjian's critical thinking. And her paper is entitled The Modern Fire Stealer, Chinese Readings of the Revolutionary Myth. Welcome, Professor Garrow. Thank you very much Jing, for this very kind presentation. Hello, everybody, and uh, good evening, everybody from Italy. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Chinese literature and Prometheus uh, as a key figure in modern China. First of all, I'm going to uh, spend a few words on the cultural premises. Then I will present a couple of uh, cultural translations of what became a universal mythology. But first, you should be reminded that uh, theoretical reflection on the concept of myth was developed in China at the turn of the 20th century, triggered by a longing for modernity and stirred by the beauty of the Greek legacy. Hence, a new literary and anthropological category of analysis emerged, namely the Shanghua Xie, literally the study or the science of the myth, which is mythology. Well, the well-known intellectual turmoil of the first three decades of the 20th century, especially in the aftermath of the fall of the empire, encompasses a diligent observation of the myth and its meanings, uh, sustained by an intense translating activity, which brings forth 
a debate on the aesthetic and ideological potential of the tragedy and of the myth itself. Um, in the wake of the momentum towards a radical uh, culture transformation of China, the distinguished intellectual Hu Shi highlighted the need to uh, assimilate the notion of tragedy from the Hellenic tradition. As early as in 1918, Hu Shi asserted that the power to reveal the true face of human existence and to excite sympathy possessed by tragedy had to become a vehicle for modern thought. And this acted as an important stimulus for a systematic introduction of the Western classics. This project was initiated by Joel Zoran, who was a prominent intellectual and a Phoenician translator, literary critic and expert of ancient Greek. But in the 20s, also the scholar Yang Hui uh, started translating the Greek tragedy and approached Aeschylus' work, starting with Prometheus. Hence, the first Chinese Prometheus bound, Beiyuqi de Pulomisiu Shi, was born in 1926, based on the English version by Lewis Gantler. But the real titanic effort was made by Luan Yansheng, the first Chinese intellectual who translated directly from ancient Greek, since he was bred with the classical education in Greece. His uh, version of Prometheus, Pulomisiu was completed in 1939, but only published in 1947 in Shanghai. And um, despite his attempt to provide a meticulous contextual framework, his philological approach and fidelity to the original uh, was not truly appreciated, but rather criticized for such a, a foreignizing flavor. Um, anyhow, the translating approach uh, was at the time subordinated to the more compelling issue of what to translate in order to modernize the newborn nation. And it is exactly in this context of the uh, obsession with modernization and with the West that the myth of Prometheus become, uh, becomes a universal mythology. And therefore, a number of cultural translations uh, come to light. In the uh, first half of the 20th century, several Chinese writers and intellectuals were fascinated by the uh, epistemological potential of Western classical mythology and then decided to reaffirm its archetypical value. And uh, in the 20s, Maldon introduced Prometheus as a dear friend of the mankind, for example, whereas Yang Hui, uh, for instance, staged an imaginary dialogue with the Titan in one of his words, whereby he encouraged the Chinese people to drink his blood so as to absorb his virtues. And in fact, he admired Prometheus to the point that he hoped that China eventually could meet uh, his own uh, uh, its own self-sacrificing self hero. So to strike the imagination and to ignite the revolutionary spirit of the May 4th generation was precisely this trait, which was taken as a symbol and um, a symbol of emancipation and enlightenment. But the very first intellectual who tried to steal the fire uh, so to speak, <laughs> to enlighten the mind of the Chinese people was, um, was Lu Xun, a key personality of the literary and cultural landscape. Lu Xun emphasized Prometheus' subversive passion and attitude, which he considered a synonym of physical and psychological pain. So cannibalism became then a major element of the archetypical so-called Prometheism. Um, according to uh, Leo Van Li, the Promethean metaphor represented for Lucian the quintessence of revolutionary struggle, uh, which also entails uh, condemned to uh, torture and martyrdom. The archetype is then interpreted as a, a grotesque uh, sublime, where the self-sacrificing hero becomes a victim and 
uh, an executioner of, the, of his own destiny at the same time. The research of symbols is what animates the reinterpretation of the myth. In fact, according to Lee, the Promethean man incarnates the dynamic, the passionate, the dominant, and the triumphant type. And this is also evident in Gomorrah's early poetry and poetics, where the Titan epitomizes strength, resilience, courage, and freedom. Um, in the May 4th era, Gomorrah romantically identified himself with the hero who sheds light on darkness. As we can read in this poem, I am a worshiper of idols. Um, to the point of building, to, to the point of recognizing a hypertrophic hero ego, like in this poem, Tiango the Heavenly Hunt, uh, which ends with the lines, I am I, my eye is about to explode. And this overflowing energy becomes um, sort of anthropophagic autophagy. Since cannibalism is reinstated by Gomorrah, who celebrated the death and the rebirth of the hero like a phoenix, thus celebrating the exaggerated uh, arrogance of the rebellion. The fire indeed evokes the power of destruction of the feudal and orthodox orthodox past in order to give birth to a new and modern Chinese nation, uh, like in this poem, the Nirvana of the Phoenixes. So it should be noted that the metamorphosis of Prometheus from an enlightened rebel to an arrogant revolutionary agrees indeed with the ideological shift in the 30s. Um, the empowered Prometheus also fascinates Zhang Zhangduo and Nieganu, who retraced and rearticulated the myth and the tragedy as well. Zhang Zhangduo called for a literature of blood and tears that could narrate of the oppression of the Chinese people. And with his four short, short stories collected in Chu Ho Du the Taibu, The Catch of the Fire Sealer, published in 1934, the author adopted Eschylus' tragedy as the hypotext to write the myth. Uh, in the foreword to his work, he reinvoked the beauty and the cultural power of the universal myth, and moreover, he instructed the readership about the many shapes of the myth in the West. But through his narrative, a dungeon duel lashed out at the inhuman tyranny. Um, in his perspective, the distance between the human and the supremacy, which is basically the relationship man God, is undermined by the Titan who finds uh, the essence of God even within the man. So, in this sense, Prometheus stands as a prophetic consciousness of the historical cultural progress, which is yet to come, together with the spiritual freedom. In Dungeon Duel's work, Prometheus um, immolates himself for the liberation of the mankind, thus becoming the icon of a martyr. Therefore, Dungeon Duel's Prometheus epitomizes the spirit of the resistance, which leads to the defeat of the autocracy and to the victory of the oppressed, thus inspiring a class struggle. His work, in fact, hints at the commitment to the demolition of the despotism and the conquest of a cultural identity. And the fire, his fire is a symbol of uh, ability, knowledge, and wisdom, and also an instrument to uh, light the revolutionary flame, um, which is the flame of civilization and uh, resistance. In point of fact, he wrote that uh, the major responsibility of Chinese writers is to spark the fire of the revolution for uh, young people. Um, Nieganu's interpretation is different and far less romantic with his novella Ti Bahu, the first fire, appeared in 1934. 
um, his symbolic reading of the battle between good and evil, namely the progressive and reactionary forces, is not confined to the uh, Chinese democratic revolution of the first half of the century, but actually refers to um, a recurrent historical process. Ti Bahuo um, presents a um, fearless and wise Prometheus, confronts himself with a depraved and cannibal god, a god eating the flesh of the innocent children offered in sacrifice, in, in sacrifice by the humans. And interestingly, the portrait of the Titan is not canonical here um, because um, Prometheus described here is a short, thin and bold headed figure, uh, but this quite ordinary appearance and physical weakness is compensated actually by a vigorous and engaging rhetorical ability. And for this reason, the character of Prometheus distinguishes himself from the uncivilized and common folk, which is um, dominated by power and by its own ignorance. The ordinary, the quite ordinary appearance uh, should then inspire the modern individual who needs to uh, acquire the courage and the knowledge to defy the God. This Prometheus is willing to betray the mighty uh, and to suffer cruel punishment to rescue the mankind from a fate of misery. And therefore he decides to uh, seal the flame and throw it uh, on the earth from above, from the sky, thus causing uh, fires all around and chaos among the, the humans. And this is when he understands that the humans still have a long way to go to uh, finally get this spiritual freedom. Nieganu's work differs from Jensen Duo's representation in that um, the soul and fire uh, stands as a tool to place a feet upon the path of the uh, ideological revolution, so as to stop uh, being eaten and oppressed. Moreover, Nyaganus Prometheus seems like a decayed demigod who is fond of the idea of freedom and ready to be sacrificed. Um, in the end, he is processed for betrayal and challenges Zeus for uh, and challenges Zeus with his um, great and fluent rhetoric. And he even recognizes the fallen of the mighty, the fallen of the gods, which is um, greatly described in the epilogue. Uh, so to conclude, um, in the first half of the 20th century, the review of the universal literary capital provides the opportunity to rethink the myth as a psychological and cognitive form of representation. In this context, Prometheus becomes not only uh, an object of study, but also a cultural agent in modern China. Since the mythology is, uh, first of all, broken up into pieces and then uh, reinterpreted and rewritten together with a new narrative. For instance, in the, in the works presented here, the Fire symbolizes the light as an intuition or as a spiritual um, redemption. So, uh, Lu Xun, Hu Shi, Mao Dun, Guo Mo Ruo, Zhen Zhen Duo, and Nie Gan Nu, as many, many other modern intellectuals and writers, uh, call for a subjective and a collective consciousness, thus reaffirming the beauty and the power of the myth. Um, in the end, uh, we can see how, along with the canonizing translations of Aeschylus' tragedy, the creative reinterpretation um, tend to maintain a trace of solemnity, since solemn is the salvific mission of the writer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now, let me introduce you to our fourth panelist, Sean 
Porterfield from University of Central Florida. Sean holds an MA from the University of Central Florida in Literary, Cultural, and Textual Studies. His research interests include modernism, transatlantic literature, and poetry and poetics. He currently, I was just updated, he currently teaches college literature in Madrid, Spain. Welcome, Sean. And the paper he's going to present is entitled Singing Art of Tune, the Difficult Images of Unanagogy's Poetry. Let's hear about it. Welcome. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, Yone Noguchi and we're going to look at some of his images. Um, and so here, here it goes. Uh, the itinerant Yone Noguchi, whose extraordinary sojourn across three continents produced a small but complex body of English language poetry, proved a beguiling literary figure from the moment his first, um, his first poetry volume, titled Seen and Unseen, Monologues of a Homeless Snail, became publicly available in the 1890s. His work since then has presented scholarships, scholars with a number of complex issues. Despite Noguchi's unique situation as an immigrant writer at the time of rising cultural tension between the United States and Japan, he has not often been thought of as much more than a well-intentioned, if somewhat misguided, conciliator of Western uh, and Eastern traditions. In re recent years, a handful of scholars have, with a certain reluctance, credited Noguchi for the spread of Japanese poetic ideas in the West. However, these concessions are typically accompanied by qualifications about the deficiencies in Noguchi's writing. Responses to Noguchi's work have often focused on its difficulty or more specifically what some have called its lack of intelligibility. Early reviews of monologues were generally appreciative, were generally appreciative but also somewhat reductive in their analyses of the strange syntactic formations and word choices in the poems. Rather than asking and probing technical questions about Noguchi's unique craftsmanship, Early critics uh, instead wrote that the poems exhibited a unique and indecipherable Japanese element, and they stopped there. These criticisms ranged from laudatory to patronizing. Carolyn Wells, as you see on the screen, a writer for the critic, praised Noguchi's poems for their intuitive grasp of nature's greatest meanings, while at the same time remarking on their oriental spirit. A critic for the Academy wrote this. It is true that Mr. Noguchi is much under the influence of Walt Whitman and it has left its imprint on, its, on his work, but that only tends to heighten the effect of the purely Japanese element. And perhaps most striking of all, an editor from the Dial wrote that although the poems contained fresh beauties and charms, they had been written in broken English by a clever man. These responses, even the most critical among them, were not damning to Noguchi's success and perhaps they were not wholly unjustified. Noguchi's poems were difficult, and Noguchi himself admitted that part of the reason he was writing poems in English was to help build his proficiency in a new language. Reflecting on his hope that learning English would help him assimilate more easily into American society, he writes this. Thus, my first period of learning the English language ended with the simultaneous entering of my first stage of English writing. About monologues, he claims, it was a spiritual flight to lose my own nationality and the most sure way to join one indomitable general mood of youth was through a poetical passport. But perhaps the reasons for the difficulty in reading Noguchi were more complex than his contemporary readers perceived. Yone Noguchi's first volume owed its production and contents to a series of factors and influences. The first of these was the hospitality of Joaquin Miller who allowed Noguchi to live in his home and provided the younger man with access to a vast library of Western literature. Noguchi was 18 and it was in Miller's garden that Noguchi studied the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and John Keats. Noguchi describes in these days his naive obsession with Poe in this way. I read each line and all the words of Poe's poems, my first love being Annabelle Lee. In time, they grew almost chiseled in my mind as I could recite them and bring out their separate words for my need. At the highest moment of my Poe saturation, I confess, I felt I was a Poe myself and could not speak any other language but Poe's. I even thought I might be his incarnation. 
it may not be so surprising then that one of Noguchi's early published poems appropriated so much of Poe's language that he was forced to respond to accusations of plagiarism. Noguchi describes those early days of reading and writing poetry as idyllic and instructive. He writes, my inner sense of poetry or poetic individuality seemed to be developing from my naked lying before the great nature. And so perhaps it is no surprise that in his first collection of, re of poems, readers saw echoes of romantic poets from the past. And most notably, they connected him to uh, Walt Whitman. Although Noguchi never claimed to have been influenced by Whitman in the same way he claimed to be influenced by Poe, the two poets did embrace a common style. Whitman famously did not bother with rules of rhyme, meter, convention, uh, and Noguchi's first poems uh, display a similar lack of restraint. As a result, many of the images in monologues find their inspiration in natural objects and resonate with an earthly self-consciousness, like the, the lines on the screen. To the eastward, to the westward, to the westward, alas, where is truthless, goodness, light? The world unveils me, my body itself this night unveils my soul. These verses position the speaker at the center of a great expanse. Noguchi showcases a democratic sensitivity to things both physical and metaphysical, creating a landscape in which converging objects of the universe perpetually flow in all directions and the human consciousness can be explored. Whether by choice or by chance, Noguchi's language creates a semantic elasticity that liberates words from their literal meanings. For instance, the words east, west, and light simultaneously associate with a search for truth and understanding, while the night stands metonymically for the speaker's disorientation. In addition, the repeated use of the word unveils, which has no contemporaneous signification, uh, but means something like to cover, creates an interesting layering effect that heightens the speaker's isolation. Noguchi's memoirs evince that he was surprised by the attention that Monologues of a Homeless Snail received, and this compelled him to explain his choices much sooner than he expected to have to do so. But regardless of whether his language choices were primarily a result of his fledgling command of a new language or a unique poetic vision, it provided him with a moment of exigence to speak for his ideas, a task that he undertook with great enthusiasm. To the critics who complained that the semantic and syntactic elasticity of his poems rendered their interpretations too difficult, Noguchi rejoined that he had done it on purpose in order to show that the rules governing American poetry were too restrictive. Noguchi began to speak and write about Japanese aesthetics frequently, asserting his value as a voice that could offer Western poets increased linguistic and creative freedom. The publication of Monologues of a Homeless Snail provided another benefit to Yona Noguchi, which was the gift of financial freedom. It did not prevent Noguchi from having to take up the occasional odd job, but it did allow him to travel and see more of the United States. He moved eastward quickly and wrote about the cities he visited, particularly Chicago, Chicago and New York. Noguchi's ambivalent fascination with urban life produced feelings of admiration and terror, which his prose, memoir, prose memoirs vividly describe. Recalling his first visit to Chicago, Noguchi claims he was taken by a devil to the city of men far beyond reach of mountain or river, a city of pig killing in a city of wonders. If monologues of a homeless snail reflected Noguchi's experience of Joaquin Miller's idyllic ranch, his 1903 volume of poems from the Eastern Sea highlights his relationship with the American urban landscape. Not only does From the Eastern Sea convey the sense of dislocation and desperation acquired by Noguchi during his continental travels, it demonstrates a major stylistic change. Even though his landscapes are still pastoral and rural, nature has a much different countenance. The same elements in nature to which Noguchi looked for meaning and understanding have become fiercely personified, fear evoking entities that challenge the imposition of any human presence. Noguchi's language after so much time in the city has also changed dramatically. He continues to create interesting word combinations and still fuses concrete and abstract, abstract nouns in particular peculiar ways, but in place of long overflowing lines, in place of long overflowing lines are terse and sharp ones as if to reinforce a much darker vision. The poems in From the Eastern Sea convey a sense of acute lostness and despair. The exultant hillside has undergone a mutation. The pastoral expanse has now become dark, obscure, and hard to traverse. The poem here, for instance, describes a hostage taking, a battle in which a cloud, a mountain, and a moon use their powers to frustrate each other. The inky, garmented truth 
dead cloud woven by dumb ghost alone in the darkness of phantasmal mountain mouth, kidnapped the maiden moon, silence faced, love mannered, mirroring her golden breast in sil silvery rivulets, the wind, her lover, gray haired in one moment, crazes around the universe, hunting for her dewy love letters strewn secretly upon the oat, oat carpets of the open field. The language here is hauntingly beautiful. It, super textual markings like hy hyphenations give the text a fragmented, uneven quality. And the personality that Noguchi ascribes to natural elements is such that all of them have distinct psychological viewpoints and motivations. Noguchi presumably identifies mostly with the wind, a restless, restless nomadic creator who scours the universe for signs of belonging and affection. During the year Noguchi published for, from the Eastern Sea, his life was in the state, a state of disarray. His travels were at least partially motivated by a desire to escape a series of romantic scandals, including the birth of his first child by an affair that had been uh, undisclosed up to that point. His poems provide a window into his alienation, his discontent. Many of the aspects, symbols, and techniques of his early poetry remain. For instance, ethereal messages still fall from the sky, the air is still laden with frost, and the moon still serves as a source of wisdom, but no longer is the mood exultant in the lines carelessly and jammed. Noguchi's personal feelings of placelessness map closely with the changes in his poetry, and as a result, as his career progresses, his poetry seems to embrace a more modern aesthetic. After the success of From the Eastern Sea, Noguchi was accepted into the circles of writers who were working to discover language and themes fit for a new century, including his friends Willa Cather and Thomas Hardy. When Noguchi published his fourth volume of poems in 1912 called The Pilgrimage, he showed the ability to create poetic images that were more energetic than any that he'd ever done before. In The Pilgrimage, he uses much altered language to focus on his most mature subject matter yet, the relationship between nature and his own mortality. He reflected that writing this volume was like waking from a deep sleep. In the poem here, titled Shadow, Noguchi uses familiar symbols to examine the process of aging and death. My song is sung, but a moment. The song of voice is merely the body, and the body dies. And the real part of the song, its soul, remains after it is sung. Yeah, it remains in the vibration of the heart sea, echoing still my song, O oh, shadow my song through. The image again is a complicated blend of auditory and visual signals. The poem reemploys certain images and techniques that we've seen before and that have been found elsewhere in Noguchi's work, such as a highly symbolic landscape, monosyllabic words, and strange word combinations. Unlike his earlier volumes, however, in the pilgrimage, the speaker is not so much an observer of the landscape, but a part of it. As a result, the focus on aging in the end of life is described not so much as a lament, but an accomplishment, one in which he finds tranquility and independence. The sound of the speaker's voice is a metaphor for the body, and the entire image turns inward at both edges upon the word song, which Noguchi calls in his, in his uh, explication a pivot word, and creates an image that he describes as kinetic. He writes, poetry is made by a com combination of kinetic with potential speech. Eliminate either and the result is no longer poetry. But you must know that kinetic language in your mind should combine its force with the potential speech of the poem itself and make the whole thing at once complete. Noguchi's explanation of his poetic image is doubly interesting because it rings very similar to Ezra Pound's famous intention to demonstrate the manner in which a poetic image might become a vortex of intellectual possibilities, simultaneously co constantly rushing and turning inward on itself. By 1912, Noguchi had become very interested in making Pound's acquaintance, and so he sent Pound a copy of The Pilgrimage along with a note of admiration. Pound wrote back that he was delighted by the new volume, but that some of the images inside of it went a bit over his head. In the years that followed, Noguchi and Pound would cross paths on more than one occasion, finding themselves in the parlor rooms of avant-garde poets, and Noguchi's influence on this group has been similarly described by scholars as having two effects, the first of which was an impact on the origination of a particular sort of consciousness that would inform Pound's evolving poetic philosophy in the 1910s. And the second result, and one that is still the subject of some debate, is Noguchi's contribution to the increase of the haiku poem's popularity in America. The import of all this is that the images within Noguchi's poetry, in all their complexity, reflect Noguchi's experience of the cultural conditions of the 20th century, an era of prolific migration, rapid global globalization, uh, 
The poems function as spaces for identity formation and reify the, dilemma, the dilemmas of Noguchi's experience in the West and apprehend a modern language aesthetic. Careful, careful readings of Noguchi's body of work can evaluate his contributions to the merging of two formerly disparate poetic traditions and better understand a modern poetic philosophy that increasingly seems to bear his fingerprint, fingerprints. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And a thank you to all the pre panelists. Uh, I plan to end the um, recording now and open the floor to questions and the discussion. So let me um, pause.